In the, at the turn of the 19th century in particular, photography had come into India in a big way. And what was interesting was to see the pictorial representation through the lens. Um, when photography happened in 1837 in France and Great Britain, it came very quickly to India because <coughs> we were the jewel in the crown and lots of people were visiting India. Uh, the English were very, very uh, interested in photography. Many of their civil servants and engineers in particular took to photography and they also became professionals. They started as amateurs, but then they turned into professional photographers. So I'm going to begin. Actually, I've titled my talk Outside In and Inside Out. I'm actually looking at the way uh, photography was perceived. And also, uh, I like this quote a lot. So I wanted to begin with this saying that to represent India by mere word painting is an almost impossible task. You know, the cultural diversity, the richness of the landscape, the, mm, uh, you know, the, the, the colors, the um, cultural traditions of the country were so uh, seductive, really, to the camera lens that photography literally had found its most uh, important muse in India. So what we see is that the emergence of photography under the British rule in India was a dynamic case study because it not only furnishes, furnished past and current discourses on the subject of photography, but it also led to newer discussions. And if you see colonial photography, <clears throat> whether it was in India, Africa, or other colonies of the empire, we see that it was not only an instrument of representation, but subject peoples also adopted photography for their own uses. And when we speak of shooting with the camera, we are also acknowledging the kinship of photography and in some ways, conflict. And in India in particular, the anthropological photographs made in the 19th century under the aegis of the colonial powers are images which are related and created by, including by contemporary photo journalists. And what we see is that the colonial photography was a documentation of a lot of architecture, and then, of course, we will see of tribes of India as well. Now, uh, there was a pivotal role in the representation and the gaze. And what I'm wanting to basically show you through the photographs taken by the colonial photographers, the people who came from the West, and photography or photographs taken by Indians here, particularly Raja Deen Dayal. When you see the photographs, you will see uh, the difference in the way the lens or the eyes behind the technological lens or, or the lens of the camera saw and viewed the subject. Most of them, in fact, were, it was a complex gaze. And most of these pictures were like single images. We do call them documentary. We do call them documents. But the, the documentary nature or definition of these colonial photographs is very different to how the contemporary definition of photography is, where you have a series of photographs which are a document. Here you see single images which make a document. So that's one of the uh, differences in the definitions of the photographs which I'm viewing of our past. Here I would like to actually 
quote one important theoretician, Franz Fanon, uh, who uh, was born in 1925. He was a psychologist and a volunteer during the Algerian Revolution and in his semi-biographical critical work, called Black Skin, White Mass, writes about the psychological trauma of being identified as an object of the white gaze. Robbed of the possibility of being a full-fledged modern subject, a person of color is determined from the outside as a thing, as an object of scrutiny. The colonial gaze determined by a set of technologies and conventions for viewing colonial realities underwrote colonial power. It turned people into observed objects and authorized official discourses of European viewers whose representations determined and fixed the status of colonized subjects. I'm going to begin with the works of John Murray who first qualified as a doctor in Edinburgh in 1831 and in 1832 joined the East India Company Army Medical Service. He spent the following 17 years as a ship surgeon and was present as the first Sikh was present at the first Sikh or Sutlej war in 1845 or 46. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run through some of these pictures and also tell you about the photographer, what he did and how it affected his photography. So his photographic career commenced after he became an officer in charge of the medical school in Agra in 1849. His photographs were first shown to the members of the Bengal photographic, photographic uh, community and were included in the Society's inaugural exhibition in March 1857. He took a selection of negatives back to Britain on his first leave in 1857 and they were published by Joseph Hogarth and mounted as single prints as a set of 30 in a portfolio. The Morning Post newspaper wrote, these views are not tinted. They are monochrome studies, now golden brown, uh, of a rich reddish sepia hue. Now they are gray and lucid, presently almost of a black Indian ink luster, but still in one form or another, monochromes, and as such remarkable richness, mellowness, and a beautiful modulation of state, of shade and tone. Then I want to show you now the photographs of Captain Linus Tripe, which occupies, he occupies a special place in the history of 19th century photography for the outstanding body of work he produced in India and Burma, because Burma, if you remember, was part of the colonial empire. It became independent only in 1935. Though he learned photography from Great Britain from amateurs who considered it um, a pastime, he recognized that it could be an effective tool for conveying information about unknown cultures and regions. He developed a professional practice under the auspices of a large bureaucracy of the East India Company. And got a beautiful set of images in spite of the Indian heat and humidity. Now, I want to show you after this, uh, Phyllis Beatos, he's got some lovely, uh, he did some lovely albums, particularly of Lucknow. And he had a rich swath of uh, work from India, China, Japan, Korea, and Burma. He catered to a Western audience and produced an exceptionally diverse oeuvre, topographical and architectural views, including panoramas, as well as portraits of costume studies of the countries he visited or when or where he lived. He was an Italian-born Br British man and travelled extensively, photographing lots of buildings. And in fact, he spent two years in India. Now we come to Samuel Byrne, again an English photographer who made an everlasting contribution to photography in India. His comprehensive visual archive of landscapes, 
architecture and peoples of India. He joined a bank in Nottingham and again, like the others, produced photography in an amateur capacity. He soon became an accomplished photographer and his work started featuring in a lot of journals of the time. He reached Calcutta in 1863 after giving up his role in the bank to become a professional photographer. He became one of the best known early photographers of India. He won numerous awards both at colonial India photographic exhibitions in England and Europe. His studio, Byrne and Shepherd, was one of the most important photographic studios in India. Now, here, the next lot I show you uh, is, are the two Irishmen who were part of a studio they had because there were lots of wars which had been fought, discoveries and news events which both uh, John Burke and William Baker photographed. Now what they did, they researched a lot and they chronicled a lot of India in Peshawar, they moved to Murray, the Himalayan hill station of Kashmir and they did a lot of documentation of the Afghan war. And what you see here is Baker and Burke's story in some ways is also the story of photography itself. Now, again, I'm going to show you another photographer, English photographer, whose name is F.A. Hawkes. Again, an engineer. He was an engineer in the Northern uh, Bengal State Railways. And the, he actually had a lot of pictures of the construction of the North Bengal State Railway scenes in Darjeeling, amateur theatricals, portrait groups, Richard Temple's camp in the Delhi Darbar and this album of 84 images were taken between, which I showed you, were taken between um, 1868 and 1894 and they also contained albumen prints. Next I'm going to show you Cuthbert Christie who also qualified in medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Now, he was a medical officer and a zoologist who worked for the Indian Medical Service between 1899 and 1901. During this time, he documented his travels across the region, taking photographs of scenes in Agra, Shimla, Srinagar, Surat, Punjab and Bombay. 114 of his images are available online with the name Cuthbert Christie album of India along with two diaries that he kept during this period. Kashmir. Now I'm going to show you some of the colonial photographic archive which was shot uh, and this was kept in the eight volume publication called the People of India, a series of photographic illustrations with descriptive letterpress of the races and tribes of Hindustan. Originally prepared under the authority of Government of India and reproduced by order of the Secretary of State for India Council. The pasted photographs were accompanied by descriptive text and these official albums were sent back to England to be maintained in the royal records. So what you see here are, a, you know, it's a real objectification of the exotica, of the nativity of the land. And now I will, I'll just show this back to you. So you have these portraits where they are staged and where they, they're actually shown as the naked Indian, uh, exotic, um, from the land, their facial features also dark skinned, different kinds and their description also if you read in the uh, tribes of India, it's done in a very, very... Um, non-empathetic manner. What I'm going to show you next is Raja Deen Dayal. He was an extraordinary man uh, who set up a studio in India and 
a very very famous photographer of uh, uh, studio photographer of this time and what you see here is that in his photographs photography also crossed the initial threshold and was making steady inroads into the territory of other graphic mediums it was being adapted by lithographers and engravers who viewed it as a commercial alternative he uh, was uh, photographing born in 1844 a contemporary of samuel burn he was from uttar pradesh who trained also as an engineer he took up photography in 1864 and 2 years later he joined the government service at, as head administrator and draftsman he established his studio lala din dayal and sons in 1868 and was later appointed to take photographs of temples and palaces across india after his retirement the following year he became the court photographer to the nizam of hyderabad in 1885 and his lens has captured exquisite photographs if you see of british india as well as native princely states his portfolio i'll just take you back to one or two shows the opulence rich costumes jewelry royal palaces hunts and parades and all highlights of the bygone colonial era his expansive body of indian tableaus offers an enduring wide ranging view of the subcontinent in fact in his photographs you won't see that same kind of exoticization but what you see is a different kind of composition the composition of his work is quite staged it's taken really it's a mix of what you see in the portrait paintings or the oil paintings which came in from the imperial colonial masters and you see the way he is staging it is very different they're all staged none of them are candid photographs so it's a very very so if you see the difference between an indian photographing whether he's doing monuments or he's photographing people there's a different complete different aesthetics and a different sense of representation then i want to show you this is something very interesting and something uh, which all of you will enjoy this is um, a, a work which is done by a photographer called ashim ghosh who has actually uh, collected photographs from and his his whole um, uh, outfit was called the casa documentation center he collected and preserved for posterity photographs which with variegated experience and memories of this very intense nation so these are all from the early part of the 20th century and see these were photographic studios which had been set up all over the Uh, country they were all set up in different towns different cities you'll see how people the social hierarchies you will see in these images you will see people coming to take family pictures typical pictures which you see uh, in pre independent india where even the local people are going to get themselves photographed marriage pictures So this is what I wanted to show you outside in and inside out. So this was actually um it's a little unfortunate that you couldn't see the paintings of this period because you know I'd already made my presentation and I only got to know that uh, William is not coming that was only yesterday but had I known he wasn't coming I would have interspersed it with some of the colonial paintings of the raj and some of the paintings which were done by indian painters and in this it would be raja ravi varma it could also be durandar and you could see how the uh, compositions in some of them were very similar to what raja din dayal did some of because um i think uh, ravi varma too though i'm not really an expert on ravi varma but i have uh, he's one of the people we as art historians all read but he was one of the people who was very much part of the technological uh, effect of technology because he was the one who set up in fact the first printing press where he brought out calendars and started replicating 
lots of images, painted images in an offset press. So these are things which, they are some of the things which I thought of and which I wanted to share with you. Um, so that's it. And if you want to ask me any questions, and I'd be happy to answer or have a discussion or... Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Kanu Priya. I want to ask that uh, what do you think that especially uh, British Raj gave uh, something distinct to Indian art, which is uh, still continuing. Um, Thank you. Yeah, which is still continuing till date. So how is the coming of British? Because India has always been a very rich country uh, uh, from the perspective of art. But as we even in architecture, like we have indo sassanic architecture, uh, seen even in Mumbai and Bangalore, everywhere, uh, the government, most of the government buildings that we have in these cities, they represent uh, inclusion of European architecture and Indian architecture. So that as a person, I see a, a continuing legacy of British art. But uh, being an expert on this, how do you think that we have permanently been benefited uh, through uh, the advent of British in art and how is it continuing and how you see that India can continue uh, continue to be benefited from this. Like, uh, what is you know, we as Indians have always been very inclusive. So you know, British the uh, the English they ruled us for two hundred years. So they also got us something. But we had the Mughals before them ruling us. Before them were the Arabs. Before them were the Greeks. Before them. So if you see. In the history of Indian art, we have always assimilated, transformed, translated, transmuted, and created something which is hybrid. And it is this hybridity which makes us very rich. So what would you say is pure Indian? Uh, maybe the dancing girl? Uh, but after that, we had so many invasions. So if you look at the Greco-Roman influence in Buddhist art, if you look at Gandhar, after that, if you look continuously as the invasions kept happening in architecture also, if you look at Qutub Minar, the Sword of Islam, we have a lot of Arab influence there. Then the Mughals came. The whole thing of large mural paintings changed and the format became a miniature tradition. After the Hamza brothers, after Humayu went into the court of Shah Tamsab, he brought with him the Hamza brothers, the scroll started. And then in the time of Akbar, the ateliers which started and the miniatures came and our handheld paintings also happened in the same way. When the British came, they brought in in some ways, what I would say, Le Plein Air, the outdoor painting, they brought in the easel, they brought in the canvas, they brought in uh, oils to some extent, because we used to work with indigenous pigments and minerals. So we were enriched by that. But that doesn't mean we gave up what we had. We included it, as you said, in architecture. We did. We have Indo-Victorian. So the hybridity has always been part of our richness. And with the British, they brought in photography earlier than it would have come had we not been a colony. It came very quickly to India. And because they wanted documents to take back with them. We also had the, the company school of painting, for example, which was something which came from them because they wanted to take back these lovely paintings as mementos, dressed as nawabs, dressed as kings, take something back to their country. So I think in many ways, you know, art tradition in India, be it painting or be it sculpture, there is an unbroken tradition. The things change, that it is enriched, something is, uh, goes behind. But you know, nothing really dies. It grows in another way. It gets a fresh lease of life in another way. So there is a syncreticism of culture which is happening all the time. So does that answer your question? <coughs> I can't see very well from here. So. Uh, a lot of... 
Yeah, and there was somebody here. A lot of these beautiful <coughs> pictures that you showed us. One more question. Okay. A lot yeah. of these <coughs> a lot of these beautiful pictures you showed us. Yes. Paintings, negatives, portraits, artifacts, so many things, so many wonderful things from India. The British, the Scots, the colonialists just took them away to Britain. What we read in William's book after the Anglo Mysore war with Tipu Sultan, mm. they just walked around, picked up these things, paintings, pictures, and so on, took them away as their personal collection, especially the Scots, even the British, to Powys Castle. That's what William writes. Now, uh, is there any way we can get them back? Because this is concerning uh, India. This is our, uh, our treasure, our stuff. Can we get them back to appreciate them more? Um, you know, this is my personal view. And I'm a born-again Indian. I love my country. But tell me one thing. Do you really think we respect what we have? And, and I don't mean to say that I don't want them back. But the Kohinoor, had it been in India, it would have been stolen and sold. Let me tell you, I saw two spectacular exhibitions in the UK. One I saw earlier this year at the Buckingham Palace. It was... Um, I'm forgetting the name, but you can Google it. It was at, at the Buckingham Palace. Those were the gifts which were given to uh, King Edward who had come to India in 1895. Believe you me, there was a, 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 a thing that given to him by the King of Jaipur. It was, um, you know, that uh, thing which, which you throw uh, rose water. It was so extraordinarily beautiful, incredible. I still cannot forget the beauty of craftsmanship. There was a, a, a shield, a metal armor with emeralds on it, exquisite. All those were shown at an exhibition uh, in the UK and all the money which was collected from that exhibition, the exhibition was taken all over the UK. If we had those treasures, would we keep them like that? At least we got a chance. The world is getting a chance to see it. Uh, the Pachanama from the Windsor Castle. We had those lovely shawls in the Crafts Museum. People have stolen it. I feel so bad. The thing is, Sure, you want to, governments can ask for it back. Many governments are asking for it. They're getting compensation for it. But as a born-again Indian who loves my, I mean, I love my country, I love my heritage, but I see it being vandalized all the time. Yes, they took whatever they could. But that any ruler does. I mean, do you think if we went and ruled anywhere else, do you think we'd be any better? We also looted and plundered wherever we could. When, we, when there were uh, infighting between the Mahajana Padas, between the different rulers, they also looted. Why did Sati and Johar happen in India? Because they were Indians were also looting each other. This is always the fight which happens between the conqueror and the defeated. This is always the case. But as a person who loves beauty, as a person who really values art, as a person who is in the service of art, I wouldn't want these things to come back. They are kept so beautifully. They are displayed so well. I mean, the the set of the um, ragamalas which I saw, I've not seen such exquisite ragamalas in our collections. Go to our museums. Do you see them on display? Do you see them with the right kind of annotations? Do you see them with the right captions? No. So this is my thing. But of course, you have you are absolutely right in wanting them back and. But I'm very happy that they're being shown to the world. Some of the, mo the most beautiful Navagrahas I've seen at the entrance, the back entrance of the British Museum. Every time I go there, I look at it and I feel so happy. Would I see the Navagrahas in the temples here? Now, thank God, we are getting a bit socially responsible. Maybe we need a little more maturity to value our beautiful objects. Thank you.